Okay, you ready? Yep. Well, welcome everybody to the 2019 Granger Lecture Series. These lecture series were funded by the Granger Foundation to highlight power systems, education, and new research ideas. And we don't have them all the time, but this semester we have a guest, uh, Tamir Rosan from Ameren, who is going to talk about distribution systems. And it's going to be 12 lectures long, roughly the whole spring semester, once every Friday, Friday 4 to 5. So welcome, Temer, uh, alumni back here. And we're pleased that you, you can spare the time. And we look forward to hearing you. Thank you. Yep. I assume it's on, Kevin, right? Yeah, thanks again, and thanks for the opportunity, and thanks for uh, you know the Granger Foundation for making this happen, and for you guys to to come here and uh, and attend. Hopefully, it'll be useful uh, to you. So I'll repeat a little bit of what we you know we talked a little bit about uh, earlier. Um, let's see if this works. That's okay. All right, so Tamar Roussan, that's my name, uh, manager of DR Integration Strategies at Ameren, Illinois. Uh, again, uh, it's, a, it's a newly formed department focusing, again, basically on the integration of DER into the grid and building strategies around, around DER control and, and operations into the future. That's, that's what I'm responsible for. I have uh, four engineers right, report, to, report to me today. Supposed to have one more added on uh, here soon by, by May, and also an intern that comes in and works for us. Been with Ameren for 10 years, two years as a co-op uh, slash part-time while I was here attending uh, U of I as an undergrad, and then afterwards uh, hired on full-time. Came back and uh, did my master's in, uh, and graduated in 2017, and my master's thesis was on the microgrid that we built here in Champaign, so that was a lot of fun. Um, these lecture series, again, kind of described a little bit in the beginning, but, but I would like to introduce more and more concept, uh, concepts around the distribution system. Um, uh, a portion of the electric grid that probably has not gotten a lot of attention in, in, at U of I and maybe academically in general over, over the past uh, uh, years, but becoming more and more of the, the topic, the hot topic of discussion around the industry. And, a revolution is, is, is happening on the distribution side. So it will make sense to, to bring that back, talk a lot more about it, get you guys familiar with it, um, and in particular talk more about, uh, about modeling of the distribution system, something that is uh, going to be extremely important to better understand um, and analyze and forecast what's going to happen to it from an engineering perspective. Um, it's all changing. The loads that we have today are changing. You know, it's not the same loads that we had 15 years ago with energy efficiency and LED lighting and all that kind of good stuff. Um, uh, the, the types of, of, of resources that now are penetrating on the distribution system, PVs and batteries and electric vehicles are all changing also um, uh, the way uh, the, the distribution system looks. So, so some of the concepts and principles around, around uh, modeling the distribution system will be, will be interesting to revisit and talk about. Um, and would really like to talk about uh, also feeder analysis, something we have not paid a whole lot of attention to. Um, on the transmission system, for example, everything from the transmission system perspective is considered um, balanced. When you come to the distribution world, everything is unbalanced. So talk a little bit about unbalanced load flow and maybe talk about the core concepts around there. And then talk most likely and most importantly about the technologies that really are, are, are core to the distribution system today. Distribution automation, what is SCADA, what is an ADMS system, uh, and, and microgrids, and, and bring those, those uh, uh, here in perspective for, for everybody uh, to understand. Um, so we talked, uh, we think maybe around 10 total lectures we're going to uh, fit in the, in the semester, maybe 12. Um, we'll try to meet weekly here for an hour, four to five. I'll use slides, I'll probably use the board. Very informal, ask questions, stop me at any time. Um, point is to get as much of this, of this material across as, as possible. I kind of talked about this a little bit, but you know, again, there's no introduction to the distribution system that I liked 
coming here out of U of I. I think Professor Howe did a great job trying to start a course, and then she left us. Um, so I think somebody will, will have to carry the torch, um, in, in, in my opinion. So we'll see what the staff thinks about adding a course uh, that's related to, to the distribution system. But really, it's, again, seeing a revolution. And when I mean a revolution, I, I, I really am seriously talking about a complete change to the distribution system. We relate to it on the industry side to what happened to the, to the telephone industry. So in the, in the, in the, back in the day, the telephone was in every home, at every business. There were no cell phones. Everybody relied on it. And then all of a sudden, the cell phone idea came up, and, and you know, some folks started having cell phones. Uh, telephone companies that did not believe that cell phones will take off, that big old thing that you put next to your ear, that's never going to take off. Nobody's going to have a cell phone. It's going to be just for corporates or maybe military. And companies that did not really follow that, that innovation and, and really um, um, dive deep into following what the customers want kind of lost and, and went out of business. And folks that really believe that that's a revolution coming and that's a true change coming to the telecommunication world <laughs> put their money in it, put their resources in it, are still living today and probably leading that, that industry. Um, so we, we relate to it here a lot to the distribution world. Distribution world, again, was a one-way system. Only one direction, uh, uh, you know, energy went from the generation uh, power plants all the way to the customer. Um, when we first started seeing people putting solar panels on the roof or trying to go off grid, we said that will never take off. That will never happen. We sell electricity is you know, too much cheap and electricity for people to put uh, on their roofs or in their garages are too expensive. This whole renewable idea is not going to take off. And you know, we're being proven uh, wrong. It's, it's happening. A lot of people are doing it, excited about doing it. It's becoming more simple. Uh, and, and again, as utilities, if we don't embrace that, if we don't embrace what the customers want, most likely we'll, we'll go out of business. So, so that's changed. Again, a revolution how we think about things and how we think about customers. For the longest time when I started Ameren, we called customers rate payers. So we didn't call them customers. They're just people that pay, pay our rates. They're customers. Uh, so, so that's kind of you know, my motivation around it. Also my motivation to introduce you to Ameren. It's a local utility company here. Does a great job, um, you know. Again, delivering safe and reliable energy to our customers here in Illinois. Um, it's a it's a great company to work for. Again, I've been with them for 10 years. I had opportunities to go elsewhere many times, but I'm still around. And um, and the opportunities that are Ameren, not only from an engineering perspective, and the exciting things you get to work on, like microgrids and like distribution automation, AMI, and and analytics and whatnot, is the fact that uh, we have a lot of openings for folks to like leadership roles. We, we have a 40% um, of our for workforce will retire in the next five years. So that's going to empty out or leave about um, you know, many spots for leadership positions for fo folks to, to assume. So if you come into the company and you prove yourself and you're a good engineer, there's always a path forward for you to, to kind of help lead the company into the future. So just some things about, about Ameren in general. We do. I have one working for me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you probably are all familiar with this, right? This is just basic electric power grid, um, you know, generation station, step up transformer. Um, we, we deliver energy through a transmission line uh, closer and closer to the community. So typically the generation station is, or the power plant is far out in a remote area. Callaway for us is one of the famous ones. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, a lot of our power plants are just, just far away from communities. And then to get closer and closer to them, we use the, the transmission system. The best way we define it in my world is anything 100 kV and above is considered transmission. That's kind of the dividing line. So we talk in, in terms of kV in, in, in the industry world. And I, I put that on a slide here. Anything less than 100 kV, and again, depending on what utility you go to, in my utility, anything on, less than 100 kV is considered distribution uh, voltage. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, higher voltage because you want to avoid, of course, losses. Um, you know, losses are a function of I squared R. And, you know, the more the more I you have, the the more losses you've got. Um, so we try to to send energy over over the transmission lines with a higher voltage to try to to reduce to reduce these losses. As you get closer to the community, you start stepping the voltage down, um, and then we go down from a transmission level world to the distribution level world. Um, Typically, the substations are, again, less than 100 kV. When you get to that level, we, we break them down um, into, into two sub-levels. We call a sub-transmission level, and we call a, a distribution level. 
sub-transmission level on, on many utilities, in, in many utilities world, uh, is anything 30 kV and above, or 34 kV and above, uh, all the way to 100 kV. So between 34 kV and 100 kV, that's considered a category, we call it sub-transmission. And then 34 kV and below is considered that distribution uh, defining voltage. Um, so this, is, this here table is, is, a, is from DOE. Um, that's how it's defined in, in the DOE um, world. Generation is 5 kV to 34.5. Transmission is 69 kV to 765. And distribution is 15 kV to 34.5. So you can see 34.5 to 69, that's another subcategory that we call subtransmission. At Ameren, we have a department responsible only for transmission, only for generation only for sub-transmission and another department purely responsible for distribution. So we truly have boxed around folks that all they do is generation, transmission, sub-transmission, and distribution. They talk among each other, but they're not a whole lot of talking. They're all kind of isolated. And when we talk about the, the modeling perspective, the, inner, the industry is, is now converging to try to build one comprehensive model. It goes all the way from distribution to generation. Today, they're all isolated. I have a model for only my circuits that are 34 kV and below. So everything that's on the distribution side, we have circuit models for them. Their power flow definitions are different. Their load models are different. They're just completely different. 34 kV to, to 69 kV, I have a, a whole different also modeling scheme. And they're, they're, they're isolated. So they're not interconnected by any, by any chance. And again, load models are different. The, Topography and, and, and power flow mechanisms for each is different. And then also transmission is a whole different world. The industry try to converge to try to put them all together in one, one model all the way from generation to, to the small node, customer node on the distribution. And we'll talk about the advantages of that. You know, as energy now is a network, it's flowing all the way from the distribution system to the sub-transmission system. It never used to do that. So now it calls for a model that I can see and have resolution over, over the spectrum. Uh, to talk about the, the distribution system, um, you know, I, I, I like to define it in three maybe categories. Distribution substations, there's primary distribution, and there's secondary distribution. A distribution substation, um, again, it's, it's something that's fed by, by one or multiple sub-transmission systems. So a typical Ameren substation looks like, like this. These are transformers. This will be a sub-transmission line. Uh, let's call it one. And then sub-transmission line number two. These could be either a 34 kV line or a 69 kV line. And they typically are different to provide redundancy. So these two lines will be different. That way, if I lose it, I'm not losing the entire substation. I have a redundant line uh, to serve the, the rest of the loads. Out of this, I'll probably have a bus with a normal open point. That could be a switch. That could be a breaker. And that ties those two lines together. Typically, they should be the same voltage in here, but I just gave an example of what it would be if, if we had a, a sub-transmission sub line that's different. Then off each one, I will have multiple distribution feeders coming out, something like this. And something like that. And you can think of those feeders here. <clears throat> Each could be feeding a neighborhood. So this could be uh, feeding one neighborhood a few blocks. This could be feeding another neighborhood a few blocks. This could be feeding larger customers, large commercial customers, like um, an ADM or a Caterpillar that's got a large, large industrial load. Same with the rest of the feeders. So each sub-transmission line will carry on, say, say, a portion of the load that you've got in a city. Multiple sub-transmission lines could be picking up an entire, an entire city. And those two will be also fed by, say, a 138 kV line. That's a transmission level. So a 138 kV line could come in and then feed those two, two lines in here. So, so that's, that's the basics here of, of how we feed the distribution system. 
transmission line, sub-transmission line, and then we come in and, and we feed our, our distribution feeders. Our transformers here inside the substation, uh, again, they're stepping the voltage down. So if this was 69 on the high side, typically what we have at Ameren is 12.47 uh, or 13.2 kV. The difference in these voltage levels are really legacy companies that came to form Ameren. So in IP's world, Ameren, Ameren uh, Illinois Power in the past, their engineers decided and their, their philosophy decided to have all their voltage levels at 12, 1247. Silco had 32 kV, but it's just it's just different different way of running the distribution system. From an analysis perspective and, and for, for our perspective, it doesn't really make a big difference. But that's what typically you have on the load side of the transformer. So we call the high side and low side. That's the terminology we use for a given transformer. Transformers are defined by their capacity, and that's typically on an MVA basis. Very common to see a 20 MV, uh, 10 MVA, a 22 MVA at Ameren World. And we'll show some examples of what, what these look like. Um, the idea of this, this bus tie here, again, if I lose one, I could rely on the second one. So if a transformer failed, or if I need to do maintenance, um, I, can, I can isolate this. And, you know, there are switches on, on both sides of the, of the transformer here, like that. So I can isolate this transformer for maintenance, open these switches, for example, close this here, and then energy would flow and supply all my, all my loads. The concept of redundancy is always existing in, inside our, our substations. So that's what a typical substation is. And we'll talk about you know, some more. I talked already about the transformers. right? One more thing about these transformers, they are typically three phase. It's very rare to see single phase transformers inside the substation on this size. So they're typically three phase transformers. If they're single phase, they're probably connected in a three phase fashion. But to my knowledge, I'd say 99% of transformers in the Ameren territory are all three phase transformers. Like I said, they're, they're they're based on MVA rating. That's kind of how we rate our transformers, and we speak uh, about transformers in, in the MVA language. Um, again, you're probably familiar with some of this stuff. Transformers have fans. You know, you can turn these fans on during you know peak um, load periods when it's really hot out there. It gives you a little bit more capacity. These are the lines that are coming in from the high side of the transformer, and then the other side will be the load side of the transformer. So the, the high side will be, the, for example, here the 69 kV, the higher voltage, and then the load side would be the, the lower voltage. Oil base, these things are pretty expensive. Um, a typical 69 to 12 kV transformer at Ameren is probably $1.5 million all the way to $3 million, depending again on the rating and the capacity that, that you get. So pretty expensive. Um, uh, devices out there. Um, trying to think if there's anything else I want to talk about when it comes to transformers. Yeah, I think I think that's about it. Now, you know, one thing to 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 mention uh, about the transformers is again because they're MVA based, they can they can provide VAR and watt, so real and reactive power. So just just a Nugget there. Yes, yes. All of them, again, inside the substation, I'd say 90% of them all have, have these fans and air cooled. Yeah. Is there any contact with them for the um, there, there is not. Uh, when we design our circuits, we have what we call a feeder head requirement for the power factor. Um, so that's more for losses and efficiencies out on the line. So we try to be as efficient as possible when we deliver the energy. So we require that, that the feeder head for each one of these feeders, the power factor be 0.98. So that's what our design criteria is for any of our feeders. Yeah, the customer loads what will dictate the VAR flow on your, on your circuit and how, how much you need to correct for that. So that's where we, you know, we'll talk a little bit more in the class about uh, capacitors and placement of capacitors to correct for that power factor. Um, so, so yeah, typically we shoot for a, a power factor of 0.98 on average throughout the year. So anytime you dip below that, you got to figure out why you're dipping below that, or if you're leading in some sense, you know, above 
Um, two, for example, you got to figure out why you're doing that. You know, you got to take corrective action. Yeah. Uh, so 0 0.99 is good. One is perfect, right? You know, that means you're <laughs> you're you're highly efficient. So yeah. You, you said that they have air cooling in the fans. Mm-hmm. They're also oil filled. Right? They are full, Yes, yes, they're oil filled. And yes. Do you get cooling from that, or is that just an insulator? It's an insulator mainly, but you could you get some cooling out of that. Yeah, yeah, but mainly they're insulating. Again, for discharges that happen. You know, the oil is a good substance to, to yes. So, so that's mainly the oil function inside the transformer. Uh, at Ameren, we have an expert for everything. So we have an expert that's, that's all they do at Ameren is spec out transformers, go out and maintain transformers, study ma transformers, you know, collect recording uh, uh, information off, off the discharge inside a transformer. So every piece of equipment, again, because it's expensive, we got folks that are, that are experts at, at their, their, um, their asset life and asset health and asset management. Um, so if you ever need more information about you know, what is a transformer doing, what type of oil you got in there, and how often we, you know, we, we, we change the oil, we can get more information on it. But yeah, the basics of it is it's oil filled and, and that to help you know, any discharge that you've got in there. And to cool, I think to cool the core, is, is one of the functions of the oil, too. OK. Another thing you'll find inside substations, we kind of talked a little bit about it, are, are uh, switches. right? And there are types of switches. Um, uh, mainly, the switches are used to isolate you know, the, the, the equipment and redirect power flow. We talked about wanting to take this transformer, for example, for maintenance. So what our guys will do is they will, will open these two switches to, to de-energize the transformer, do whatever work you need to do on it, refill the oil, do whatever maintenance you have to do on, on a transformer. And then you use another switch to redirect energy and have these loads fed by the other source. The three main types of, of uh, switches that we've got inside substations at Ameren are, are there, disconnect switches, air brake switches, and load brake switches. Really, the, the, the main difference between them is your current interrupting capability. So as current flows through these switches, can you interrupt current without damaging the device or not is the main, is the main concept there. And that depends on the rating of the, of the device that you've got or of the switch. If you go to a switch yard, these are very typical you know, switches that we, use, that we use at Ameren. Both are S&C switches that you can come in and, and see. Manufacturers are, are galore uh, for the industry. You got GE, you got Siemens, you got all these guys make very similar uh, devices. But at Ameren, you can see some of that stuff um, easily. So these, these disconnect switches, like I said, are, 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 this is what their main purpose is, is to, to take equipment out of service um, for maintenance and also redirect, redirect power. These could, be, these could be operated manually or with a motor. Uh, so there are things that are called motor operator switches too. So there's a motor, you know, the recharge coil. You push it, and it's an own. You can you can hear it cranking and open the opening the switch. Or a, or a lineman can come in with a stick, you know, basically place a stick on on one end of the switch and just pop it open, and it will open open the switch. And again, you're 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 basically um, disconnecting the path of of energy to your device. So the first two, you don't open. You do not. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll see a big arc. And uh, I think I put a link there. <laughs> put a link there to what would happen if you if you if you do that. If you don't have the the current um, uh, interrupting capability. Um, again, because it's it's non vacuum. It's air that 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 discharge will will catch on fire and basically it'll cause that arc. Could again could kill somebody. Um, and that, that's exactly what would happen if, if you would open it uh, when it's not de-energized. So typically, you would really like to de-energize the 69 kV line from its source. The next component of the substation we'll talk about is a circuit breaker. That's what we would use. Circuit breaker would de-energize the entire line. And I'll go a little bit more into operations. So the real, the real world, you'll have a guy standing here waiting by the switch. And then you get somebody sitting in a command center push a button and de-energize the 69 kV line from its source. So from its source, from the, uh, from the main um, 69 kV source, this whole thing will become de-energized. 
pick up the phone or the, the, the wireless or, or the cell phone and call this guy and say, okay, I de-energize a 69 kV line for you, test it, make sure it's de-energized, and then go ahead and open the switch. These commands have a specific language, specific instructions, mainly for the safety of the, of the co-workers that we've got. So he's standing in line here, waiting, he gets that instruction, he tests his line, make sure it's not hot anymore, then he will go ahead and open that device and de-energize it. That language, that world we call is WPA, Workers Protection uh, Application. So, so that's, that's what we call it, and it's got a book and everybody runs by the book. If you deviate, very bad consequences will, will happen. Okay. So those were switches um, that you will find inside a substation. Other devices you will cite in there are circuit breakers, reclosers, relays, and fuses. And let's talk about each one of those. So, so a circuit breaker, difference between that and a switch, of course, are, are, are a few. One, it's capable of not only interrupting current, but also is, is capable of interrupting fault current, which is a much, much larger in magnitude. So again, I'll give you an example. Current on a typical distribution feeder like this could be 200 amps, 250 on, on hot days. That's the amount of amps you're providing to your load. So the customers, as they turn lights on and off, fridges are on, all that equipment is drawing current. The totality of that on one feeder could be around 200, 300 on average for our, for our feeders. When there's a fault, when there's an abnormal condition that happens, so two phases touch, right? Now all of a sudden you have a very small impedance, everything's flowing through that, that point of, of connection, and a huge, large spike in current occurs. It could reach up to 4,000 amps. Huge difference between your load current and then your fault current. And that, if it stays, it's now causing damage to you know, additional equipment on your, on your system. It could burn lines, it can burn devices, it could cause, again, safety uh, problems. So, so circuit breakers are protective devices. They're sitting there looking at the current, and any time the current crosses a threshold that you as engineers decide that is, that is, that is dangerous or that is, that is limiting, you go ahead and, and the circuit breaker will open. It will interrupt that current. So right away it will open. These will open in oil or in vacuum. The newer designs of a lot of our circuit breakers and reclosers will open in vacuum. That we don't see that discharge happen in that arc. will open and de-energize that line automatically. That's mainly what a circuit breaker is for. Other purposes is you can go ahead and open it again for what we just described here. So there's no fault, but I need to open and de-energize that line during load current. So the customers are being fed and hot by it. I need to open it during load conditions. I can go ahead and open it. It can handle that amount of current and it will open. So that's typically what a circuit breaker does in generality. It's three phase device most of the time. Uh, again, 99% of circuit breakers that I know are, are three phase devices. So they open all phases at the same time. A recloser is, a, is similar to the circuit breaker in terms of it's an it's a in, interrupting device. It's a protective device. It does the same function that I described uh, for, for, the, for the circuit breaker. One of the main differences is it could be three-phase device, meaning it can operate on phase basis, single phase basis. I can open A only or B only or C only or A and B, right? Or I can operate at three phase. The other difference in it is I can program it to do a reclose sequence. So we just talked about how if I have a fault, two, two lines could cross. So say a tree limb came across, sat on a line, pushed it, made two lines touch. Circu the recloser will open right away because it will see a fault, it will open. The recloser can be, be reprogrammed to wait a small amount of time and then try and close again, see if that fault is still there or not. Did the tree come off? Are things back to normal? So instead of my customer seeing an outage and, you know, I'm just going to risk it and open the device, let's see if I can close it real quick. So we'll close. Our typical sequences on the distribution side are 5, 15, and 30. So five seconds. So I, I open, and then I wait five seconds, then I'm going to come back hot and close and try the line. See if I'm going to, to stick, meaning it's going to stay hot. There's no fault. The fault is not there. I don't see it anymore, so we're good to go. Sometimes you see blinks in your lights. That's what's happening. A recloser just saw a fault. It opened real quick and closed to see what's going on. So five second, 15 second will be the next interval. So the second time it will wait, it will wait 15 seconds, again, to see if the fault cleared or not. And we'll try again. 
The fault is still there. We'll try one last time 30 seconds later. Right? 30 seconds later, we'll try one more time. And the fault is still there. We're going to open permanently until we figure out where the fault is and what's going on. Right? That's what really is unique about a recloser. It's got that reclose sequence. And you can decide. Today's world, you can decide on, on these intervals. You want them faster. You want them slower, depending on your system, depending how you want to how you want to engineer it and do it. A relay, um, really you can think of that as, as, um, as the brains of the circuit breaker or the, or the recloser, the eyes and the brains, right? So it's got the measuring units to it or the measuring devices into it. So the CTs and the PTs, current transformers, so that gives you the current magnitude and voltage transformers. This gives you the voltage magnitudes coming off each of these lines. So if I have a circuit breaker here, I know the current and the voltage most likely on both sides of me. So I know the current upstream and downstream, and I know the voltage upstream and downstream, and that's being fed to a relay. Small box. Today's world, they're all microprocessor based, so they're all small computers, right? And that information comes in, it's digital to you, and you as an engineer can program it. I want you to trip anything anytime the current is higher than 450 amps. I want to trip any time the voltage go below 60% of its, of its rated magnitude of 13.2 or 12.47, depending on how you want to do your protection. And maybe we'll dedicate a class or maybe half a class to protection at some point, because I think that's important. But that's a whole different world on how you protect your, your distribution uh, transformers and distribution feeders and whatnot. But that's what a relay does. The most well-known relay in, 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 in my career has been Schweitzer. We call it the blue box, yeah, SEL. So these are the most well-known ones out in the, in the industry today. Fuses, poor man way to protect the distribution system. Right? These are old technology, existed for, for, a, for a long time, but it still is reliable and it's used across the system. We use it typically on taps. We don't use it on the primary. So we'll talk about what a primary system is, but primary is you know when you come out and you're three phase so you have three lines a b and c and they they all go out of the substation go out into the world your houses or your apartment buildings could be fed by just one single phase that's when we call it the tap so you tap off here this could be a house feeding just one one customer maybe multiple customers if they're living off a off a building on taps we try to protect those with a fuse so it's not a very you know, expensive device, not a big recloser. Right? What a fuse does, it's got, a, it's got a, a melting characteristic. So it can handle current and temperature. And as that temperature goes up, you know, when you have a fault, that causes excessive heating. And based on that fault, that has a melting characteristic and it will melt and it will pop open. That's what a fuse does. So the engineer will decide what is that limiting factor per that tap. Um, Typical sizes we call 60T, 80T, 100T. These are just sizes of the fuses, and they are all dictated by the thermal energy they can handle, and that is really calculated off the, off the current, the fault current that is seen downstream of them. So fuses are typically used to protect tap, uh, tap loads or tap devices. All right. Voltage regulation. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, great question. So again, maybe that's why we need to dedicate a class for protection. Talk about symmetrical components. And the, the 4,000 amps or 4,500 amps are typically symmetrical uh, fault currents. Um, you have a single phase fault. Uh, two-phase fault, three-phase fault, and we'll talk about those and we'll talk about what causes them and again the symmetrical characteristics of each when we talk about protection. But it's a fun, it's a fun topic to, to dive into, yeah. Yeah, the 4,000 will be a three-phase fault. So everything we talked about, you know, we just described the substation, what's inside it, the devices that we've got in there, things that protect, things are used to reconfigure the distribution system. Um, one important element that, that happens on the distribution system is, is voltage regulation. And actually in Illinois, there's a huge effort around voltage regulation. We call it voltage optimization. I don't know if you've, any of you heard about it. But voltage optimization is a measure of energy efficiency here in Illinois. 
So I'll get a chance to talk about it here a little bit and then maybe describe it again later on in the course. But as you come out of your, of your distribution substation and you're going out towards your loads, the, the voltage here is a, is a, is a function of two, of two elements. So V is equal to the current, the load current. So whatever the loads are drawing multiplied by the impedance of the line. A voltage drop is calculated by doing that times, again, the impedance seen away from the substation. So if you're close to the substation, your impedance is low. right? So the voltage drop is going to be low. It's just a direct relationship. As you go farther and farther away from the substation, your impedance is larger. Right? The amount of copper you've got, the amount of line you've got. And the farthest you are from the substation, the larger the voltage drop you have in here. So how does voltage affect what we do? Everything that you have in here in your home or in a building is based on ANSI code. ANSI is American National, National Safety or oh, Standard Institute. Thank you. So ANSI code dictates what equipment we have here and how the voltage is, is supposed to, to, um, to be appropriated to them. So the ANSI code for the distribution level is 113, 114 volt on the low end and then 127 volt on the high end. That means any device that you've got is supposed to operate within this band. If the voltage dips be below this band, your equipment is going to see an abnormal behavior. It's going to dip in performance. Your lights might flicker. Um, you know, your TV might, might not be as, as bright. Um, so, so depending on what you've got here, your equipment is going, going to behave in a um, non-satisfactory way, let's call it. So, so we, at, as a utility, try to make sure that your voltage coming out of the outlet is between 114 and 127 per coat, OK? So if I live at the end of the line here, right, because of this voltage drop, so let's say coming out of, this is, my, this is my boundary, so if I come out of the substation at, say, 120 volts, right, as I go down here, because of this voltage drop, I might be risking that this customer might be seeing 114 or 115, right, so whatever voltage he's got. So I want to make sure that this customer is not going to see a violation. So I'm going to regulate the voltage. So I can bring it up or down depending on my impedance, depending on my load. So I study the circuit. I figure out what my impedance is. I figure out what my load behavior is. And I'm going to control what comes out of here. That's really how you should do it. Utilities took the easy way out and said, OK, we're going to have a standard. Coming out of every substation, I'm going to set my voltage to 125 volts. And then that is allowed to fluctuate plus and minus one volt. That could go up one volt or down one volt. That's the standard. That way I don't have to design every circuit. I don't have to call every engineer and figure out what their voltage regulators are set to. The devices that regulate the voltage is a voltage regulator. It's a small transformer, right? And then you tell it what you want it to regulate the voltage to. And it will step up and down within its coils to boost the, volt, the voltage or buck the voltage. So that depends on the source that you've got here. So as the source fluctuates, you're fluctuating as well to maintain that set point. So that's what utilities did. They said, OK, we're going to do 125 at the substation. That way we don't risk anybody at the end of the line to see any low voltage. And that will help us a ton. What turns out to be, this is not very efficient, 125. Because that could cause high power losses that also could cause an efficient use of energy inside your home. Some appliances might consume more energy at 125 than they would consume at 120. So there's a huge initiative in Illinois to try to figure out how to optimize the voltage for every feeder in a way that you're still within the band, but you are making energy delivery efficient. So you're minimizing the losses, you're minimizing the, the usage of energy while you're still delivering energy within this band. So you'll see today, at Ameren, we have about 2,600 feeders. Of these 2,600, about a third, so about 1,000 of these circuits, are going to have brand new controls, brand new mechanisms to optimize the voltage on those to try to deliver more savings to our customers in terms of energy and optimize the energy consumption. 
So again, that might be worth another class, but it's a very cool topic as well that we've got going on on how do you decide the optimal value of the voltage here, right? What mechanisms and what technologies do you use to optimize voltage on your feeder? What I want you to get out of this is a voltage regulator is the number one tool that we use for regulating voltage down, down on the circuit. Another tool that we have is a capacitor. So the capacitor controls typically VARs, and VARs do help boost the voltage up and down depending on how you use it. If you close a capacitor bank, meaning you dump more capacitors on the line, you're most likely bringing the voltage back up. If you open that, if you take that capacitance out of the line, you're typically bringing the voltage down. So we'll talk about how these are used as technologies to optimize voltage on a circuit maybe one of these, one of these days. Another tool is the LTC. Some of these transformers come with an LTC, a load tap changer. That does exactly what a regulator does. The only difference is an LTC, because it's on the transformer, that's regulating voltage for all the feeders. So I lose the capability of controlling voltage per feeder. Now I got to control that entire bus. So all these feeders are now controlled by one unit. So I don't have a luxury of really designing each feeder with its own optimal voltage point. So it's got, it's got a little bit of, of um, less flexibility, I would say. I'm not doing great on time, so I'm going to try to hurry up with these, with these last few slides. What's very important for us, especially today in the modern world of smart grid, is metering. What that means is I want to be able to get as much information as possible off all my devices. So what you'll find out that at Ameren, we try to meter the substation transformer. So off this, I know what the voltage is. I know what the watts are, I know what my VARs are, and I know what my amps are. These are the main four criteria I'm bringing back on every transformer, on every feeder. And the idea there is I want as much data as possible to try to better understand, better engineer, better analyze my circuits. In the past, a lot of this stuff was forecasted, a lot of this stuff was predicted, because we didn't have means to measure and then store that data. Today in the smart grid world, every one of these, you will most likely have metering off of it and data is coming through and being stored. So I can do all my analysis based on that. It varies from one utility to the other. You know, to, to us at Ameren, we use what we call a SCADA system, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System. So here I got a meter, and then next to the meter I got a radio. This radio could be, could be a, a basic, uh, 900 megahertz, say, radio. It could be a cell modem radio. Uh, it could be a microwave radio. Different technologies you can use that radio to communicate back these measured devices. I'm sorry, these measured quantities. So I measure those through a meter, and then I communicate those through a radio back to a central location. That central location collects all that information from every substation I got, from every meter I got, and stores it in large, large databases so our engineers can analyze and study all that stuff. Typically, we, we go and measure the data. So I talk to these points and I go bring them back once every minute. But I don't store them once every minute. That's a ton of data. So what we do is we average them. And what I end up storing is data based on one hour intervals. So I average all the data and I store hourly intervals. Every utility is different, but most of utilities, I'd say 90% of utilities store one hour data. And retention also for those is different. So I, I, re, I retain one hour data for 10 years at Ameren, for example. If I have sub-hourly data, so say 15 minutes or whatnot, I might store that for a year, maybe two years. So every, every data point is a little bit different. But what you can take for granted is I have one hour average data. Typically, that's retained for 10 years. Because of time. Can we? Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. Then I'll stop here. This is what a SCADA one line would look like. This will be the last thing I'll talk about. But a SCADA one line, this is actually what an operator in a room sees. SCADA, again, is supervisory control and data acquisition. So I've got that information available to me in real time. So as an operator sits here, he's seeing I got a 138 kV line right, coming through, and there's a transformer. The transform steps down the voltage to 69. 
That diamond there is a symbol for an LTC in my utility. So that transformer has a low tap changer. It's controlling the voltage right there. And I got megawatts, megavars, and MVA on that breaker right there. B030, I got real time loading on it. So I know that there is 18.4 megawatts going from the 138 kV line through, through the 69 network. Here's another 138 kV line, and it's carrying 58 megawatts of load, again, in real time. And that make 58 megawatts are flowing through to the rest of the circuit. So this one is feeding these circuits here, and that line is feeding these circuits going that way. Does that make sense? This same substation also has a 12 kV line. So that 69, once it's stepped down, it comes back and gets stepped down one more time from 69 to 12 kV. And you can see, again, I have metering here. So in real time, I see 8 megawatts are going through down here to these feeders. There's that normal open point that I talked about that ties two buses together, right? And then these are my feeders that are going out to the neighborhoods that are out in the, in the world. So we'll pick up next time, and I'll talk more about what this device is. That's a recloser, and its measuring points, and all that kind of good stuff. And we'll go through a couple more examples. Okay. Cool? Thank you. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah, thanks.